the All Party Group on Inclusive Growth for 2016. So we're basically here this morning uh, because we believe in a fairer society than the one that we've got. And if we're going to get there, we believe that we're going to need a new kind of consensus for the way that our economy runs. So the role of the All Party Group on Inclusive Growth is to basically bring together people from across the political divide, from across government, from across business, from across finance, churches, and civil society, to try and find where are those consensus points about reform of the way that markets work in our country, where are the points of difference, and how can we identify some practical measures uh, for reform. And I want to pay tribute to uh, this morning, in particular to the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Justin Welby, um, who's been a sort of a strong supporter of the group since we were created just before the election. Um, and what we've got sort of circulating today is sort of some of the papers and some of the lectures that um, we've uh, organised over the last year, including His Grace's um, great speech <coughs> last year. The way the group has organised its work is, is around a very simple idea. We think that we can create a more equal economy if we raise the level of productivity growth in our economy and then strike a better split between what goes to workers and what goes to capital. So the kind of agenda that we've got um, for the rest of the year just unpacks some of those themes. So we basically believe that we need capital markets that are more patient. We need labor markets that are rather more skilled. On the supply side, we need a better push from science and technology. On the demand side, we need trade reform that encourages fair trade, not just free trade. We want product markets that are far more entrepreneurial. We think that people need to pay their taxes. We think the economy needs to be more devolved. And in the boardroom, we think there's a good case for corporate governance reform, and in some industries, better corporate behavior too. So over the course of this year and next, we'll be organizing events and topics around uh, those uh, eight themes. And what you'll see us do in each and every one of those events are bring together some of the leading thinkers globally and in our country to try and find those points of consensus, those points of difference, and to pinpoint those practical measures uh, for reform. So I'm absolutely delighted that, there is, uh, uh, that we have with us one of the world's best thinkers on this topic uh, this morning, Professor Stiglitz. Um, many of you will uh, have known his, um, his publications, but the one I want to highlight uh, this morning is what I think was a seminal piece of work um, that uh, Professor Stiggs published last year through the Roosevelt Institute called Rewriting the Rules, um, which is a forensic analysis, not just of inequality uh, in, in America and around the world, but some very practical measures to propose the way uh, that some of our institutions need to change. So the way that we're going to um, organize this morning is I'm going to invite Torsten Bell, uh, who is the director of the Resolution Foundation, um, who are very kindly hosting us here uh, this morning. Torsten's going to set out some of the things that they're studying at the Resolution Foundation, some of the themes and some of the patterns of inequality uh, in the UK. We're then going to invite Professor Stiglitz uh, to share some thoughts with us. Uh, and we're then going to ask um, Rain, who's the head of economics at the CVI, um, to just offer a few responses, uh, a few thoughts uh, based on what Professor Stiglitz uh, has said, in particular looking at some of those points of agreement and just pinpointing some areas that are going to be, I think, more contentious for reform uh, in the UK. Uh, and then we're going to throw it open uh, to you. And I'm delighted that um, uh, our vice chair, uh, Right Honourable Caroline Spellman, is here with us as well this morning. Uh, and she's going to do the much more difficult job uh, of chairing you answering questions uh, before we wrap up um, about 11 o'clock. So without further ado, um, please welcome Torsten Belt, Director of the Resolution Foundation. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. The, um, we're going to rewrite the rules in an hour and a half. So <laughs> what can possibly go wrong? Who'd have thought, right, if we make this work? So I'm going to do a... Um, a uh, fairly UK-centric summary, UK-centric with a twist, uh, summary of inequality and what's been happening in uh, recent years largely, so that what we then hear from Professor Stiglitz is set in a bit of context about what's been happening here and how the rules of the game that he discusses uh, might have led to some of the changes we've seen in the UK over the last 30 years. So, what is... Right. Right, this is the... This is like... If you only need one graph today, this is it. 
it tells you one very central thing, which is the 1980s were not just bad for fashion or music, they were very bad for British inequality, uh, and that is largely the uh, 10 percentage point rise of, of the Gini coefficient across the 1980s. That is the largest single change in inequality in Britain since the war, and actually is the, it's the structural shift that has happened. So across the, and it's actually pretty evenly spread across the 1980s, different things are going on in different parts of the 1980s. The first half is to do with economic change, the second half is to do with changes in redistribution, but in general what we saw was a structural levels change, a one-off change in the level of inequality in Britain. That has actually not been changed since. There are different measures of what's happened since, but in simple terms it is broadly flat since then. There was a slight drift upwards as the top 1% takes more of the income through the 90s and towards the mid-2000s. There is, as you can see on that graph, on the right hand, far right-hand side of it, a actual drop in inequality of recent years, which I'll come to in a second before you all get too optimistic. The, um, there is absolutely no grounds for optimism uh, from that fall. It um, turns out that if you make everybody poorer, you can reduce inequality. The, but unless anyone wishes to advocate that, the, I doubt it's a replicable uh, mechanism. Now, just briefly, which is, um, this is my only mention of housing, I promise, but it is an increasing area of focus for us. The top line here is inequality after, before housing costs. So it takes into account redistribution, but it doesn't take into account coughing up for your housing. The bottom line is including housing, and you can see that the, the gap has actually been growing in recent years. Right, this is what is driving that change. So these two <coughs> graphs, just focus on the left-hand side for a second, is the change in uh, earnings since 1977 up to um, about a year ago for different percentile points of the UK income distribution. The top is richer people and the bottom is poorer people. There, without getting into too much complicated. The issue here, as you can see, is that the increase in inequality is being driven by large earnings increases for those at the top of the distribution. Earnings, not income. So I'm saying that the earnings is driving a large chunk of that. Better paid people have done better in recent years uh, than worse paid people. The uh, and that, that is also what is driving the fall in recent years, i.e. the richest lost the most during the recession, which is actually not the case in lots of other developed countries. But in the UK, the richest lost most. So the 90th percentile lost 8.4% of their uh, earnings between 2009 and 2012. The 10th, i.e. The, towards the bottom of the income distribution, only lost 73 Now, both of those are pretty catastrophic. In fact, they're the worst fall in income that have happened on any form of measured history. Yeah, so they're very bad, but they did reduce inequality in Britain during this period. Uh, just to say the obvious, which doesn't appear in the inequality debate very often, or often enough, the right-hand graph shows you there's another thing called inequality going on, it's called gender inequality. The, um, and women across the income distribution, wherever they are, are earning significantly less than men, and actually the difference is larger than lots of the uh, income differences across the percentiles. But the, but, so it's earnings that is driving a large chunk, but not all, but a large chunk of the long-term changes in inequality. Right, reasons for optimism. There's only one of these. So reasons for optimism. In the, on, on our now casting of income data of what is going on in the UK economy right now, we've had a good year in relative terms. So this graph from left to right shows you the poorest are on the left, the richest are on the right, and the uh, axis is showing their growth in their income uh, between 2013-14 and 2015. The, um, and basically we've seen a return to income growth People are not actually getting poorer anymore. That's a good result. The, um, but the, and the poorest have actually seen the largest increase in their income within that one year. And the reason for that is because we've seen very robust employment growth, which tends to be benefit the poorest most. They tend to have lost their jobs in the first place. Uh, and because we have seen very, very, very low inflation, i.e. zero inflation for a large chunk of that period. It is not because earnings suddenly went through the roof in, in absolute terms. You weren't getting a bigger pay rise at work for example, the, unless you were on the minimum wage, in which case you had quite a large pay rise last April and you're about to get another one this coming April. The, um, so there's the good news. This hopefully is the bad news. The bad news, right, this is what we forecast is going to happen between now and 2020. And so it's exactly the same thing, but for the period 2015 to 2020, and it shows you, one, in reasonably obvious terms, that inequality on our forecast is set to increase significantly over those five years. That is has been driven, and I'll come back to this, by one thing in particular, and that is by benefit cuts. Uh, benefit cuts have a very, very large effect on inequality because they tend to be concentrated on a smaller proportion of the population towards the bottom. That is what's going on across this uh, next five years. When they reverse the tax credit cuts in the 
uh, recent autumn statement. They clearly didn't reverse the universal credit changes that take place by 2020, most of which will be in. Uh, and in specifically, the losses towards the bottom of that are also being driven by some large families losing very large amounts of money. The, um, uh, but everybody who's on benefits will be seeing their income squeezed across these five years due to a no uprating of cash benefits during this phase. The, um, towards the top of the income distribution, the increase is being driven by a return to low but not horrendous earnings growth, i.e. once we've had the big boon from employment growth that will at some stage peter out, what is going on with earnings and the rich benefit most from uh, generalised earnings growth. The, um, so that's what we expect to happen. Uh, what does that mean in the real world for some people on low incomes? It means that poverty will go up. So uh, the top line there is child policy. The blue line at the bottom is household poverty. The, the line is what's actually happened on the data, i.e. for once there is a good, there is a, like we should celebrate where there's been success. There was an unprecedented fall in child poverty in Britain uh, between the mid-90s and 2010. Actually, I'll come on to the immediate now, which is a bit of an odd phase, but there's been a big fall. That is, that is a massive result, and that doesn't happen by accident. The, um, uh, but we project, those, the dots re represent our projections. We're not gonna, we don't spurously try and draw a line, given that we are, when you're forecasting this level out on poverty, you are not quite making it up, but you are kind of fiddling around the edges. The, um, but the fact is, is clear, the changes in benefits, without, without something absolutely spectacular happening that we don't expect, uh, will lead to a very large increase in child poverty. And on our forecast, it will actually lead to it being back above where it was in the 1990s. The, um, you might think that was a catastrophe, you might not, depending on what your view is on poverty. The, um, right, now, the 1%, the 1% um, the are very, very rich, but they are also very, very hard to measure. The, um, that's because they don't answer surveys, because you can't find them. <laughs> I was like, slightly caricature, but that's basically it. Uh, and even when you do find them, it turns out they don't tell you the truth about how much money they've got. Who would have thought? So, right. The, so this is, this is um, uh, almost an understatement of the truth, but I'm going to give it to you anyway, which is the rise in the income share of the top 1% over time. And it basically tells you, and you have to smooth this because there's only, there aren't that many of these people, and so the data's very jumpy. So this is three year, average, three year averages. But in the mid 1990s, the top 1% uh, had about 7.4% uh, of the income in Britain. That rose to around 11% by 2011 14. So when I said to you that the 1980s was the disaster for overall inequality, there is a, uh, there is a thing going on after that, which is the 1% share is actually still rising significantly and fast during that period. The, um, and so we shouldn't, so although the Gini coefficient which measures the entire distribution was not jumping through the roof, this is still going on. So this is about, when people talk about the new inequality, the top 1% versus the rest, this is that. The, um, uh, yeah. I should say on tax and the increase on post-tax, i.e. what's the bottom line there, net income, is not quite as bad because we have actually put up some taxes uh, on the rich recently. The, um, right, so that is what's going on with their income share. This is data that just came out yesterday. This is as close to news as we get today, the, um, unless Joseph's going to make some later. But the, um, uh, So this is the latest tax, so this is not survey data, this is actual tax data uh, of the incomes of incomes, not income shares, of the top 1% in 1314. And it shows, so the only thing I want to draw your attention to is one, you see a big drop in 1011. So as I said, the rich did lose a lot of money. If you've got a lot of money, there's the biggest recession in history, it turns out you lose some money. The, um, uh, but their incomes are actually now on, la on this data in April 13 and 14 saw their first significant rise post recession. Now, some of you, did anyone see George Osborne yesterday said, there's great news, we've had a um, uh, huge increase in tax receipts from uh, the rich, this proves yeah. that you should cut top rate taxes. The, um, now, I'm obviously agnostic on that question, but the, uh, that's a lie. Uh, the, um, but leaving that aside totally, the po interesting point is the, um, so it's gone up by 3.4%. This is real terms. So it's actually gone up by about 6%. Or the, um, now, the, um, uh, what do you believe is going on here? Now, George Osman is right to say one thing that's going on here is behavioural change driven by a cut in tax rates. So there was a fall in 12 13. That is in part driven by people holding off income in 1213 to not pay the 50p rate and then spending that income either earlier or later, getting that income either earlier or later to pay a lower rate, which is one of the reasons that's driving that 3.4%. But it's unlikely to be the only thing. So all I would say is we are starting to see a return of income growth 
at the top. We just don't know. Let's wait and see what happens. As I said before, doing individual year data on this is quite hard. But the um, but you will obviously have you can you can either think that very fast income growth at the top shows that tax cuts have been a total triumph, uh, and they've incentivised huge innovative ways of changing behaviour, um, and so the economy is going really fast, but they happen to be getting a large share of it. Or you might think we're back to the bad old days of the previous graph I showed you, which is income shares of the rich rising faster. The, um, so let's just let's just step back from the UK the, um, and say so where, where does the UK fit internationally? The, um, right, here's the re here's the really depressing news, which is on market income inequality. So this is what does the market system, what Joe will later call the rules of the game, deliver in terms of inequality in Britain before we get anywhere near the redistribution system? And the answer is now this is uh, this is 2010 data from the OECD for really boring technical reasons. Uh, so we, there were, uh, but the actual the big picture is, is generally true even on more recent data. But the, um, but the UK actually has higher inequality than any other major uh, developed country on, in a, on market outcomes. And it's higher than the US, which obviously doesn't fit most of people's pop understandings of what is going on with global inequality. But actually, interestingly, France, Germany and Italy basically have the same level of market inequality as the US and the UK. So if your view of capitalism is there's this Anglosphere model and then there's this lovely continental model where everyone's okay, they, that is what is known as nonsense. They're, they're, so they're basically, they are, they are all pretty bad at delivering market outcomes in terms of fairness. Oop. Oh, I don't know. Have I turned off your screen, Jobs? I'll be honest, it's not, it's not as good with a black screen. <laughs> Hey, you're trying. Right. The, um, so the, the, the orange bar that we've now added is inequality after redistribution, after tax and benefits. As you'll see, the world is very different. So the UK has very high market inequality, but does have a decent level of tax and benefit redistribution. <laughs> As the, uh, and that's changed over time. And this is 2010, so it'll be different in 2020. The, um, but we redistribute a lot. And the difference between the UK and the US is principally being driven by a much weaker redistribution system in the US, which again wouldn't be that surprising if you know what you know about the US tax code and other things. So that is what's going on. And, it, and the difference between us and continental Europe is again driven by this redistribution, not by market outcomes per se. The, um, uh, yeah, or, I mean, to say the obvious, you want to, it turns out that you want to live a long way north if you want decent market outcomes. Canada, Sweden, Norway, the, um, I'm slightly Swedish. I have a bias in telling you all that it would obviously be better. Uh, if we were all like Sweden. Right, last chart, the, um, and this is because there's a danger in this inequality debate that we focus on the developed world and how awful it is, the, um, but we should then focus on something else, which is over the last, so this graph shows you, again, left to right, poorest on the left, richest on the right, it is the global change in your global, in the global income distribution of income between 1988 and 2008. Yep. So what's going on? And in really simple terms is the global middle has actually done quite well over the last 20 years. The Chinese middle class, or in the middle of the distribution, who we are caricaturing here for effect as the Chinese middle class, have seen a 70% rise in their incomes during that phase. That is a really good thing because lots of those people were in circumstances that we might think of as absolute poverty prior to that, and that is a triumph. But, but the developed world, which is the bit between the 80th and 90th percentile on that graph, has seen basically flat incomes for a large chunk of those 20 years. The, um, we obviously think that is a very, very bad thing. And worse than that, the very top 5%, so the bit that you can see racing away on the top right-hand side has actually seen um, in absolute terms, so this is in percentages, but in absolute terms has captured half of the total rise in incomes across the world during that period. The, um, so you either want to be a Chinese in the middle class with low expectations that are exceeded, or you want to be incredibly rich. The, uh, those are your two options for success in modern global world. Perfect. Great. Great, Torsten. Thank you very much indeed. Give him a round of applause. That was excellent. Um, so Torsten has um, set the stage beautifully, um, and now it's a great privilege to introduce Joseph Stiglitz. So as many of you know uh, from his work, Joseph uh, is an economist. Um, he is a professor at Columbia University. Uh, he was the senior vice president and chief economist at the World Bank, a former member and a former chairman of the American President's Council of Economic Advisers. Uh, oh, and of course, he won the Nobel Prize. So please join me in welcoming Joe Stiglitz to the stage. Yeah. Joe. Yeah. The floor is yours, Joe. Okay. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, let me 
uh, say one of the reasons why why uh, I'm so happy to be here is uh, what Liam uh, describes as what uh, UK is trying to do. Uh, what we've been trying to do is is to create a broad consensus across the Atlantic, around the world, about what has been happening to inequality in the global economy. We're part of a global economy. To get a consensus and understanding uh, across all parties about what is going on and hopefully reach a consensus about what can be done about it. So uh, the idea that, that if we could get a cross-Atlantic consensus, it would actually help uh, move the agenda on both sides of the Atlantic. So that's uh, why I'm really pleased to be here. Now, uh, as an American, uh, I, do, I do want to express the view that we, we always do things uh, better, uh, bigger than anywhere else in the world. And I, I, it's a little embarrassing to, to say that here in the UK, but uh, we do. Uh, and as, as he pointed out, uh, we have achieved the highest level of inequality uh, anywhere in the world, uh, and uh, the the uh, the point that was made is this is an after-tax uh, distribution of income, and I'll come back uh, to that theme uh, a little bit later. Uh, I want to uh, just to 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 frame things and go over the numbers very very quickly uh, to to contrast. Uh, some of the perspectives that were described for the UK and talk about what's happening in the United States because I think it, it, it helps uh, shed light on, on what is happening. Uh, one, the Gini coefficient is, is a summary statistic and, and you can't summarize what's going on in the income distribution uh, with a single number. You want to look at both the top, the middle, and the bottom. Uh, also, I want to emphasize income is not the only aspect of well-being. There are many other aspects of well-being uh, that are not captured by the income statistics. That's really been one of the uh, uh, themes of this International Commission on the Measurement of Economic uh, Performance and Social Progress, the high-level expert group on that subject of the OECD. So I'll come back and talk about those themes uh, uh, a little bit, too. And what I really want to spend most of my time is uh, talking about is interpretation of what is going on. Uh, because that sets the backdrop for uh, what can be done about these issues. Well, if we begin at the at the top, if you remember the statistics that he uh, uh, showed, uh, at the top the top one percent in the UK gets about twelve and a half percent of uh, national income. The number for the United States is twice that. And the higher up you get, uh, the you might say the depending on whether you're in that top one ten percent or, or not, uh, the worse or the better it gets. Uh, so the, the share of the top 1% uh, over the last third of a century uh, in the United States, the share of the top 1% has doubled, but the share of the top one-tenth percent has increased almost fourfold. So we used to think of oh, the distribution of income as constant. In fact, when I was a graduate student, one of the questions that we asked is, why was the distribution of income so constant? And we developed a whole set of theories, all of which we have to throw away now, because the question we're asking now is, why is the distribution of income changing uh, so rapidly? Uh, so at the top uh, uh, is this very dramatic uh, number. Uh, Oxfam every year at uh, Davos comes out with a report which uh, forcefully captures uh, what has been going on. Well, they describe uh, a bus uh, that has, uh, originally it had about 85 people, I can't remember, 85, 86 people, uh, that had as much wealth as the bottom 3 billion people in the world. So get the picture of this, that 88 people, most of whom were in Davos, uh, at that meeting, <laughs> had as much wealth as three, three and a half billion people. That's an astounding level of wealth inequality. But the good news is that bus gets smaller and smaller every year. <laughs> so that this year the bus was under 70 seats. So this is greater efficiency. You only need a bus of 70 seats to have as much wealth as the bottom uh, 50%. Um, 
I'll come back and talk about the U.S. statistics uh, a little bit uh, uh, more. Um, so that's uh, the top. There was an old idea called trickle-down economics that don't worry uh, so much about the top. It's really what's happening in the rest. And the idea was that if you if the top did well, everybody uh, would also do well. That was called trickle-down economics. It actually was very much part of U.S. economic policy, even under the Obama administration. The idea was uh, Fed policy would create uh, an asset bubble, the stock market would do well, and everybody would, as a result, do well. Well, it hasn't happened that way. Uh, the top, as I just said, has done very well, but in the middle, median income in the United States, and you saw that in the charts for the UK, uh, median income in the United States is lower than it was, adjusted for inflation, lower than it was a quarter century ago. But uh, as pointed out, uh, different groups have been affected differently. There are still huge disparities between, uh, across genders, but they've begun, become somewhat smaller. The result of this is that when you look at what has happened to the median income of a full-time male worker in the United States, it's lower today than it was 40 to 45 years ago. So if you want to understand what's happening to American electoral politics, which I, you must think a little weird, uh, I think that tells you a lot. There are a lot of people that are described as angry, and they finally have figured out that they're not doing very well. They're not doing as well as their parents. Some of them are not doing as well as their grandparents. So median income, as I say, of a full-time male worker who is not working, if, if you can get a job, is working, I say, even more hours, is lower than it was uh, more than 40, 45 years ago, adjusted for inflation. At the bottom, things are even worse. The UK has raised the minimum wage, the United States has not. The minimum wage adjusted for inflation today <coughs> is lower than it was 60 years ago. So if you were at the bottom, you would not have gotten a pay raise for more than a half a century. <coughs> so in my mind, if we, uh, you know, an economy that is not delivering for a such a large fraction of their citizens is clearly an economy that's not working. So I, I think it's unambiguous that we can say the American economy is a failed economy and one has to fix that. And Economies that have aspired after the American model, and to some extent, I think a lot of people think the UK has aspired. Uh, in some ways, you've exceeded us. If you look at that before tax uh, market income, it's even more unequal. Those who aspired have had outcomes that are similar to uh, the United States. So um, uh, that that describes uh, the broad picture. Um, as I said, there are many different measures, uh, of many different aspects of, of what is happening. Uh, that, that's just income. Uh, a, a very important aspect, uh, and one that resonates very strongly politically, is that the basic perquisites of a middle class lifestyle are no longer attainable. And so we're talking about home ownership. He emphasized the home, uh, you know, home ownership, sending your kids to college, a secure retirement. Uh, all of these are things that are increasingly out of reach of uh, a majority of Americans. Or at least they feel insecure in them. If we talk about wealth, uh, Wealth inequality is much larger than income inequality. So as bad as all those numbers were, if you look at wealth data, they are, to the extent that we can measure them, uh, much worse. Um, I described the Oxfam bus. There's another statistic that sort of captures this for the United States. Uh, eight Americans from two families who had the wisdom of choosing the right parents, so they didn't work for their money, wealth, uh, inherited their wealth, have as much wealth as the bottom 44% of Americans. 
And that's testimony to how much wealth there is at the top, but also how little wealth there is at the bottom. Uh, what has happened in the, la in, in, in the last few years has made things much worse. And in the UK, there are some respects in which things are better. In the United States, I would say things overall are worse. They're worse in two ways. First of all, uh, the recession was really hard on Hispanics, on African Americans, because as part of aspiring uh, parts of American society, they had bought homes and they then lost their homes. And they lost, with the home, they lost all of their wealth. So if you look at the wealth statistics across uh, Hispanics, uh, African Americans, the numbers are absolutely devastating. They, uh, but even if you look more broadly at income, in the first three years of the so-called American recovery, 91% of all the gains went to the top 1%. So for most Americans, the issue is what recovery? Uh, I was here, I was at Jackson Hole where, where the uh, central bankers get, get uh, together every year uh, in August and there was a large protest uh, that I uh, involved in where we weren't allowed uh, to wear, to, to carry signs. Uh, we have restrictions on free speech, uh, uh, but uh, we were allowed to wear t-shirts and everybody wore t-shirts showing the graphs the graph showing that for Hispanic Americans, for African Americans, there has been no recovery. Unemployment rates, which on average are very reasonably good right now, but high disguised unemployment, for them, open unemployment it remains very, very high. Uh, in the United States, uh, we don't have uh, public health. Uh, we don't have, uh, 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 we don't re recognize the right have access to health care in the way that you do in the UK, and it's been a major battle here for you to retain that. But let me describe what happens if you don't, and reminder of why you should fight very strongly. A uh, recent study that just came out by Agus Deaton, who got this year's Nobel Prize, pointed out uh, that uh, for uh, white American males, and the reason they f focused on white was that quite often when people look at the statistics for the United States, they say, oh yes, but you have a very diverse society and people who, who uh, don't have good uh, life, uh, 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 ways of, 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 of organizing their lives. So for white Americans, life in the middle, life expectancy is decreasing, and decreasing significantly. Um, a pattern of decrease that has not been seen since the fall of the Berlin Wall in Russia. And it is a result of the same decline, the numbers of the income that I showed before. And that gets reflected in depression, uh, suicides, uh, alcoholism, uh, drug overdose. So there is a real dysfunction that is showing up not only in income statistics, but now in every aspect of well-being. Finally, Two other things just want to mention very quickly, uh, dimensions that are really important. Uh, one is access to justice, <clears throat> that we think in our democracy, equality of, ac uh, you know, right to access to justice is, is a basic human right. Not true in the United States. Every morning American children say, I pledge allegiance to the flag and all that uh, uh, patriotism, and then at the very end, uh, uh, with justice for all. And we now we're changing our pledge of allegiance to say with justice for all who can afford it. Uh, no, that hasn't actually happened yet, but uh, that is the reality of our system of justice. And in terms of the American dream, uh, equality of opportunity, uh, America uh, is really part of, uh, I would say, our identity uh, and the way others perceive us. Uh, the American dream is a myth. Uh, there, are, we have the, you know, I, the the lowest level of equality of opportunity uh, of any of the advanced countries, with exception of two others that are grouped together at the bottom, UK and Italy. So what that means, and I tell my students, there's one important decision you have to make, 
in your life, and that is choosing the right parent. Because if you don't choose the right parent, your life prospects are not very good. The life prospects of a young American are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in other advanced countries. So, uh, I could go on and, and describe how, how uh, disparities on the basis of race and gender. Um, I want to just pick up on one uh, other aspect, which is childhood poverty. Because one of the things about childhood poverty is, you know, putting aside that joke that I just gave, children do not do not choose their parents. And, they, 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 and, and you might say adults made mistakes that led them to their poverty, but children, uh, you can't blame what they have done. And today in the United States, one out of five children are growing up in poverty. And uh, that does not bode well for the the future of the country. So that brings me to really the main the theme of the, what I want to talk about is given this large inequality, United States, the UK, uh, and actually in most of the countries, uh, in uh, continental European countries, um, what, what can we say about what's happened to the market economy, what's happened to capitalism, uh, what is driving these changes? Well, the first thing I want to, to emphasize is that if you looked at those charts, what you noticed was, yes, there were a lot of similarities, but there were some big differences. The, the Northern Europe, uh, European countries, Canada, have much lower inequality. Some countries have not had the increase in inequality that the United States and the UK have had. France has not had that increase of inequality. It is not the weather in Canada and Norway and Sweden that leads to them they're having less inequality. If you did a regression a statistical study, it would probably be an explanatory variable. But uh, there is nothing about the weather that leads to more uh, equality. I can assure you that there is no economic theory that is a climate-based theory. Uh, climate change will lead to more inequality. Let me say, that's a really important point. But this cold weather is not what is causing the greater equality. So it says something else is going on. There are a few countries, uh, particularly in Latin America, where they have succeeded in significantly bringing down inequality. In terms of the measure of Gini coefficient, as fast as it went up, it almost went down as fast as that in, in, in Brazil. So that, the, the fact that there are such differences in the levels and the changes in inequality across similar countries says something. What it says is it's not just the economic laws that are driving this. And I want to emphasize, it's not just the economic laws that are driving the inequality in market income. Because those were very large differences there. And it certainly is in market forces that are causing the inequality in after-tax and transfer income. It is policies. It is politics. It is how we shape the market. Uh, markets don't exist in a vacuum. And how we shape them, the rules of the game, affect market income. So that has led to a debate about uh, what is going on. There have been three, three basic uh, theories uh, that have been put forward uh, by various people, and I'm going to uh, go through uh, uh, those three very briefly and try to explain uh, uh, why. They, they all have a grain of truth in them, but uh, one of them uh, the one that I'm putting forward, is the real explanation for, for what is going on. Okay? So, so there are a group of theories that do focus on normal market forces. And market forces have had some role, but even then we have to uh, say markets don't exist in a vacuum. We have to think about how they shape them. So these are theories that are based on, you might say, uh, 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 demand and supply and trying to understand why it is that the forces of demand and supply would, sh would, would change in ways that might lead to, 
to uh, a greater inequality. One aspect of the two two ideas that that again have some grain of truth in them. One of them was skill bias technical change. That technical change took the form that it increased the the uh, productivity of skilled workers relative to skilled work unskilled workers, and that increased the disparity in, in wages. Um, uh, another one is that globalization, the integration of the countries of the world brought onto the labor market, in an integrated labor market, uh, uh, a couple billion people from China and India as part of an integrated labor force and so of, of relatively unskilled workers. And that supply effect of unskilled workers would nor and actually have have expected to to have a uh, uh, decrease in wages of unskilled workers in in the in in the advanced countries. And so, what you're seeing that globalization story uh, has a little has some truth in it, and and it showed up in the Milanovic the Branko Milanovic chart that he showed, where you saw the. The big losers in the last 20 years were uh, the middle and lower middle class in the advanced countries. The big winners were the middle class in China and the emerging markets. So uh, I don't want to uh, uh, underestimate the importance, but I want to, to uh, of these uh, economic forces. But I want to uh, uh, argue that it can't really provide a uh, full explanation. Um, and there are many reasons for this. It can't really explain why it is that different market economies, the banks' market economies, have had such different outcomes. Those forces that I just said, skill by technical change, uh, globalization, operate basically all our global forces. And so why should Northern Europe, why should Canada have had less inequality uh, than uh, than other countries. If we look at the top, it's very clear that something else is going on. If we look at the the um, uh, share of the top one percent of workers, of what are called workers, they're not really workers. We're talking about CEOs, bankers. Nothing can explain their increase in wages, and that. That point was uh, based on normal market forces. That was brought home very forcefully by the crisis of 2008, where the bankers had brought the economy to the brink of ruin, and yet they walked off with million-dollar, very large bonuses. You can't talk about that as a normal market economy. The increase in general in CEO pay cannot be explained by these uh, market forces. Um, you. Uh, there are other, though, puzzles that, that cannot be addressed uh, by these uh, models. One of the striking uh, 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 charts for the United States, and I think this is true also for the UK, is if you look at productivity growth of workers, say the average worker, median worker, non-supervisory, whatever category of workers that you, you identify, uh, Productivity has grown pretty steadily, say, over the over the post-war period. Grown a little bit more slowly in the last third of a century, but it's grown uh, rapidly over o overall. Okay. From the end of World War II until around 1980, a little bit before 1980, productivity and uh, real compensation moved together. So in other words, when productivity doubled, workers' wages doubled. But since 1980, wages have been virtually stagnated, and yet productivity has increased. Something fundamental has changed about the way market economies operate, such that workers are not getting the any share of the increase in the productivity uh, that uh, uh, is occurring. Um, so uh, the, these are, are uh, uh, a couple of the, of the explanations for why I'm not 
I'm convinced that this provides only a part of the explanation. It's not really an adequate explanation. The second group of ideas associated with uh, Piketty focuses on savings. And um, uh, so he's focusing on inequality, particularly in uh, the, uh, at, at the top. And what he's observing is that the wealth income ratio is increasing. And that mo much of the wealth, most of the wealth is held by the wealthy. And that therefore, if the return to capital doesn't decrease, that means the share of the wealthy is going to be going up. So it's almost an a, a identity, it's a, it's a, a tautological total, total in that sense. But there are uh, several reasons why this explanation uh, is unpersuasive for explaining uh, what is going on. Uh, I won't go into some of the more uh, theoretical uh, aspects of it, but the first point is it doesn't explain in any way the puzzle I gave before about why should productivity have continued to increase and workers' compensation not increase. And it says nothing. This is about how the pie gets divided. And something's peculiar about the way the pie is getting divided. So something else is going on. There are a lot of uh, other peculiar things. Normally, if you thought that wealth income ratio was going up, wealth, you know, the economy is getting more capital, wages should be going up. And even more so if there's technological progress, increasing productivity. But wages, average wages, medium wages, have basically stagnated. And what happens then if you look at the data, if you look at the saving statistics, what one realizes is that what really has been going on in our economy is that wealth has been going up, but capital has actually been going down relative to income. Now that seems uh, paradoxical. What is the difference between wealth and capital? The answer is very simple. It has to do with ranks of a whole variety of kind, capitalized ranks. The easiest idea is land ranks, value of land. If the value of land in the Riviera or in Southampton is going up, wealth of the economy is going up, but there's no more capital. It's not like the economy has become more productive in any sense. In fact, if people are putting all of their savings into buying land in Southampton, <laughs> they may not be investing in machines and productive uh, uh, capital. And that is precisely what has been going on. That the capital income ratio in the United States and in many other countries is actually going down. Because it, resources are being diverted to unproductive uses. Another way, uh, there are many other forms of rents. Another form of rents are monopoly profits. Bailout rents, if the government is giving large subsidies to particular sectors, pharmaceuticals or financial sector, <coughs> the capitalized value of those shows up in the wealth of the economy. But what isn't showing up is the fact that taxpayers are worse off. They're paying for those. Consumers are worse off because they pay for the monopoly rents. And so you see one side of the balance sheet, which is the wealth as we measure it of the capitalist, but we don't see the other side, which is the well-being of consumers. So these are instances where wealth, as we conventionally measure, can go up, and yet the well-being of society is actually going down. And that provides actually a, a framework for understanding what is going on. It is not the savings in a real sense that is driving inequality. It's these perversions of the market economy that are driving what is going on. And that comes to the third explanation, which is uh, the one that, that uh, is reflected in this book, Rewriting the Rules of the American Economy. 
which focuses mostly on the inequality of market income, the high level of market inequality of market income in the United States and the UK, but also on the redistribution, it's the rules of the game. One way of thinking about this, from an American point of view, but there's a similar story in the UK, which is a third of a century ago we began an experiment. Uh, Thatcherism, uh, Reaganite. We began an experiment of changing the rules of the economy. I won't talk about the historical why we did that, but think about it. We began an experiment. Now, if uh, there are two big ingredients of that experiment, it was to lower the tax rates at the top, free up the economy, liberalize, allow uh, financial markets to run in a more deregulated way, liberalize, all kinds of things. And the idea was a very simple one. Lower tax rates would incentivize, freeing up would give more space, and the two together would lead to a growing economy. A growing economy that would grow so much that almost everybody would be better off. Yes, they said there would be more inequality, but that's the politics of envy. What is really more important was the fact that every group in society would be, in their theory, better off. The cake would be, the pie would be bigger, you might get a smaller share, but the size of the slice would be larger. Well, after a third of a century of this experiment, we can say unambiguously that it has failed. We now know the results. It's not a result of a one or two or three, a little bump. We know the results of that experiment. And the result of that experiment is that only the top 10% have done well. You looked at those charts that were presented, the bottom 90% have had basically a stagnant income for the last third of a century. A stagnant income for 90% of the population. Now, if in our democracies, Reagan or Thatcher had come to our population and says, I have this great idea, this reform, everybody's in favor of reform, we have this reform. This reform is going to do two things. It's going to slow down our economy, and what growth we have will all go to the top 10%, most of it will go to the top 1%, a lot of it will go to the top 1%. Tenth of one percent. Let's say they had honestly presented the voters with that option. How many people would have supported that reform? Well, it's a rhetorical question. I hope. <laughs> I think the answer was no one would have supported those reforms. But that's not how it was presented. It was presented in a lie, in a sense, with a different theory. And I think I I I, I think genuinely many of these people actually believed it would work. I don't want to say that they really, you know, they, they were dishonest, they really believed. But when things didn't work out, what did they do? They doubled down on a failed theory. They said, let's do a little bit more. We haven't done enough. It was sort of like the medieval blood letter. You know, we've let out so much blood, we've invested so much in this experiment, let's do it a little bit more. And the patient now is really, really sick. So that leads to the view that we have to, once again, rewrite the rules of the economy. We have to understand what were the aspects of rewriting the rules back then that led to these disastrous results and what we can do to rewrite them. Not to go back to where we were in 1980, but to rewrite them for the 21st century. So just to give a couple of, of items to, that... that uh, highlight some of the ways in which the ways we rewrote those rules led to slower economic growth and more inequality. One of them is the rules of what are the the uh, corporate governance, uh, the the rules governing corporations, um, a whole set of investor fiduciary responsibilities. I can you know lots of detailed rules that led to an increase in short-termism. You know, today in America, a quarter is a long time. It's the nanosecond, which is the metric 
Um, and we have the you know uh, high speed training, the talking about nanoseconds. Well, if you're focusing on the quarterly returns, let alone on the nanosecond, you're not investing in your workers. You're not investing in technology. You're not investing in the long, in, in the kinds of capital goods that are going to lead to long term economic returns. You're speculating in the short term. So that's one example. A second is the way you run Fed policy. Fed policy has not been concerned about employment, about, uh, you know, they had QE, quantitative easing, but they never asked questions like, is the money going to provide finance for small and medium-sized enterprises? Where is the money going? We're a huge increase in liquidity, but the money didn't go to where it would have led to a stronger economy. It was all based on trickle-down economics. We get the stock market up, people will spend more, and that will resuscitate the economy. Didn't work. And in the regulatory role, they again failed. Today we have the basis of electronic payments mechanism. Moving money from your bank account to a, to, to, to a merchant's bank account when you buy something should cost a fraction of a penny. But our monopolistic banks charge 1%, 2%, 3%. It's a tax on every transaction, but a tax that doesn't go for public purpose. It goes for enriching the coffers of the banks. The banks are yelling all the time about a, financial, a small financial transaction tax and saying it would destroy the market economy. But they are imposing a tax on every real transaction going on in the economy, but a tax that goes to increase their profits. So I could go on, but what I want to emphasize in all of this is that this frame then leads us to the question of what are the rules of the game, the way we run our education system, our health care system, what are the ways we run a market economy that have led to both more inequality and poorer economic performance? And by doing that kind of analysis, we can reach, I think, a broader consensus that all of us, or at least the vast majority of us, could be better off with a different set of rules. And I hope trying to forge that understanding is, is what we will uh, be able to achieve uh, as uh, these discussions go forward. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Right, our final, um, final speaker before I, um, I, ha I hand over to uh, Caroline to chair a QA and a um, is Rain Newton Smith. And I'm delighted that Rain's able to join us. The group, um, uh, since we were created uh, over a year ago, has done a lot of work um, with the CBI. Rain's the Director of Economics at the CBI. Uh, she was before that the Head of Emerging Markets at Oxford Economics, uh, where she was also the lead expert on China. And we've asked Rain to come along, just offer a few sort of reflections and thoughts um, on what we've heard, and then we'll throw it open to the floor. But Rain, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm happy, I, if the mic still works, I'm happy to... Uh, just, to uh, okay, all right, I will go on, I'll go on. <laughs> Um, uh, so, uh, thank you for that. I think what I will do is, is uh, sort of build, from, build on that. I think what I can uh, probably add to the discussion is, as sort of uh, a chief economist, uh, and probably importantly, uh, speaking for the CBI, so we represent, uh, our members represent over one-third of, of private sector employment here uh, in the UK. So hopefully I can bring that sort of business uh, perspective to uh, some of these uh, issues uh, and also as one of the World Economic Forum's young global leaders hopefully bring in some of that sort of global uh, perspective. I mean I think um, and drawing out for the all-party group I think where there clearly are some points of, of consensus in terms of, of policy and, and what needs to be done. I'll maybe leave the points of contention uh, for, for Q&A and um, I'm happy to sort of draw those out. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I think we're all agreed that one of the things about the recovery in, in the UK, where it's been particularly uh, successful, is in creating jobs. Um, and we've got employment at its record highs here uh, in the UK. Um, and uh, to my mind, that does have quite important implications 
uh, for where we go uh, from here as well. But I think as we've seen, there's no doubt real income growth uh, has been disappointing. Last year was, was the first year um, that household uh, real incomes uh, actually sort of returned to, to where it had been sort of pre-crisis um, in terms of uh, growth on the year. Uh, but that was after eight very tough year for households. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any sort of prospect of catch up for those sort of lost years. Um, and, and I think one of the things, um, and I, I think this does sort of highlight where there is uh, some real consensus. So uh, a year and a half ago, the CBI uh, published what our big <coughs> flagship report was about growth for everyone. And I think even the fact that an organization like the CBI is putting out a report like that and making it one of our flagship reports really reflects the fact that even amongst the business community, there's a real uh, consensus that this is an issue, that it matters. Uh, and maybe if I draw out some of the, the points from that report, um, you'll see where the sort of consensus is. Um, I think one of the things that stood out is even if all you care about is growth, and I don't think anyone in the room is in that position, uh, inequality matters. It does matter uh, for growth. The IMF and others have obviously done uh, work on this. You know, if in the UK uh, we could uh, decrease that, some of that increase in our, our Gini coefficient by five points, so basically if the UK could become more like Belgium, uh, we could raise our economic growth every year by 0.5%. Uh, um, and I think one of the things that has been touched on already, but I think you can, this was something we drew out uh, in that report, and I think it's really important, is that in the UK, the intergenerational income elasticity, which is a huge mouthful, is very high. So essentially that means that it's, it's 0.5, whereas if you look at countries like Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Canada, uh, it's more like 0.2. Um, so that means, as we said, the pay, of, we don't pick our parents, um, but the pay of our parents is a huge determinant in the UK uh, of what your own household income would be. Um, and this is, you know, a real sort of personal, on one level I, I feel a personal concern when I look at my young children and I think about uh, how will they be able to afford housing uh, in the future here in the UK when we know that we're not uh, building enough homes. Um, and I also think about how will they be able to save properly uh, for their retirement, particularly in a world of low real interest rates and longevity. Uh, and probably most importantly, how they as, as young women will be able to participate uh, in the jobs market. And yet when I look at the data, I, I know that actually it's not them I should be worrying about. Uh, it's their friends, really, um, because in the UK we remain not as socially mobile uh, as other countries. So I guess the, the question is, we know there's an issue, uh, but what can we do about it? Well, I think one of the things that the report draws out, and I think this is a, a point of a quite a big consensus here uh, in the UK, not a full consensus, um, is that we need to have a, a focus on, really, on early years learning uh, in the UK. By the time a child starts school here, uh, if you come from a low income background, you're already up to one year behind your peers. So there's something we need to do about access uh, to learning before uh, kids even start school. Uh, and, and, the, and the differences get worse as you get older. So by the time you're, you're 25, if you're from a low income background, you'll on average learn, uh, earn two pounds less than, than your peers. Um, and I think, so the importance of providing good quality um, child care for very young children uh, is clearly one way in which we can tackle some of the inequality uh, here in the UK. And I think there's also a flip side to that in terms of participation uh, in the labour market and a clear link with gender inequality. And I think that's actually something where within the business community there's quite a large degree uh, of support that we need to do better to get parents um, particularly from low-income households participating uh, in the labour market. And that was one of the things um, that really happened during this recovery, is actually the, the cost of childcare went up uh, by almost a third between uh, 2010 and in 2014 uh, in the UK. So over those four years, uh, a lot of, and that's where a lot of this sort of squeezed middle uh, in the UK came from. It was working households uh, who were also having to pay for it increased uh, childcare. And we know 
uh, from economics and more generally, that if we can get more, more people participating in the labour market, particularly more women uh, with young children, and keeping them in the labour uh, labor force while they are uh, having their children, um, at least keeping those links, um, will have more, a more talented workforce uh, and more growth overall. So I think in terms of the, the sort of policy recommendations that, that came out of, of that report, I think, you know, what can business do? I think businesses can look at, uh, importantly around flexible working, uh, around really uh, making sure that there's opportunities for parents to, and carers uh, to have more flexible uh, working, uh, to help them sort of manage uh, work-life balance. Uh, I won't go on, there's obviously a huge debate around productivity uh, in the UK which has just gone sideways over the past eight years and what we need to do uh, to address that. But I think there's clearly a role for business in terms of how we manage our, our businesses, how we adopt uh, new technologies to help drive that higher productivity uh, and therefore higher um, pay growth. But I think the, the, best, the best cases or the best practice examples amongst business also provide really good routes into high school work and also really good works within their businesses to move up uh, the ladder. So I think you can look at a, a company like John Lewis Partnerships which has a clear focus and they've done some really excellent work looking at why do some people in their organization uh, enter in at, at the lower pay end but <coughs> then, then end up stuck there. Why don't they move up as they stay uh, in that company and they've really tried to look at the reasons for that and what can they do as a business uh, to address that and I think there's something that businesses uh, across the economy can, can learn from some of their uh, example. There's more on financial uh, resilience but, but we can maybe come on to that uh, in questions. I think for government um, there is a real role and it's interesting I think when we look at the kind of redistribution of, of the UK system we can see that that's uh, a clear way where the UK ends up being more balanced um, than otherwise and, and one of the recommendations we had in the report was to look at the national insurance uh, contribution so I think it's interesting the political discussion has now focused on the personal income allowance so that's uh, but actually if you really want to target lower income households the national insurance contributions uh, for employees kicks in uh, much earlier than the personal income uh, allowance. So I think that's something where, you know, we at CBI have said that that's something we should also consider um, when we look into that. And I think also for government there is a role in terms of this provision of, of childcare. Uh, and at the moment there's still a gap from uh, statutory maternity pay, which for most people comes to an end at the end of nine months, um, to the provision of, of um, support for childcare uh, from the age of two or three, depending on your individual circumstances. So there's there's a gap where there could be more uh, done to to target uh, low income, but also uh, working families more generally. Um, and I think finally, particularly in the UK, everyone has touched a little bit on on housing, but clearly we just need to be mil building more homes, uh, both to buy, but importantly to rent. Um, and particularly affordable homes. I think there's a clear consensus that more needs to be done, um, but it seems to be harder to get that housing supply uh, to actually happen. Um, and I think finally, I'll, I'll just conclude by saying, you know, clearly this is a global issue. There are some real um, issues for the UK uh, in particular, and, and maybe because I'm sure there are some, some uh, great minds uh, in the room. Um, the World Economic Forum's Meta Council on Inclusive Growth uh, have partnered with uh, the Harvard Development Center and also MasterCard's uh, Center for Inclusive Growth. And they have a call for proposals out at the moment for proper policy actions as to what we can do um, to try and address some of these issues of inclusive growth. And that's open uh, for another couple of months. So if you're interested, do submit some great proposals. And I look right. forward to well, the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, can I make the suggestion, the speakers, that you just pull your seat forward a tiny bit because the 
folks on the wings here that actually can't see you, and I certainly need to be able to catch a good size. So we're a little constrained on time because we indulged uh, Professor Stieglitz a little bit, but I'm sure you'd agree it was worth doing. He's come a heck of a long way this morning. So and thank you, Ray, for um, keeping your remarks quite concise. And actually, in a significant focus, I'm, I'm thinking you see it through the prism of the way it, it works out for women. Uh, thank you so much for doing that. So we've got about 20 minutes or so for questions from the floor. So um, please do catch my eye. If you could just say who you are and if you like where you come from, it just helps people understand you know, what, you know, what your focus is. So have we, I'm, I thought we might have Lord Bird, uh, originator of the big issue, right on the front row here. So please, go ask the first question, John. You ask. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I probably come from a completely different wing of this. Uh, the gap between rich and poor, inequality to me is an effect. It's not a cause. Billionaires don't break into our bank accounts at night and uh, raid our income. <coughs> what I find so incredible is that people don't talk about the fact that probably from the early 60s onwards, the world became a place of mass consumption, absolutely mass consumption. And the gap between rich and poor is caused by these people here and by people like me buying from Steve Bezos, buying from Steve Jobs, and all those kind of things. And I therefore believe very, very strongly that when Marx said that we need to, we need to get hold of the means of production, I think he got it all wrong. What we need is the means of distribution. So if we had social means of distribution, we wouldn't produce the Steve Bezos. We would have a social Amazon. We'd have a social Tesco's. We'd have a social Walmart. And what it is, is these people. It's the people who can make this enormous change. But they don't choose to. There is only one real example in John Lewis in the UK. And I know that there are very, very small social businesses throughout the world. But until social businesses and social ownership become uh, uh, mainstream, then we will always be chasing this terrible gap between rich and poor. We are the creators. We are the manufacturers of that gap. I am ashamed to be the man who helped build Amazon along with millions and millions and millions of others. Okay, so that's a really good, quite uh, challenging first question. So who on the panel would like to respond from a social entrepreneur to respond to that? Okay, so let, let me, let me uh, try to get, you know, the, the question in some sense is why uh, is Amazon making so much money when standard uh, uh, textbook economics say that competition should be so strong that uh, uh, Amazon is just barely breaking even. Uh, and the answer is that we now understand that there are many forces leading to monopoly power. So you said people didn't break into your bank account, but in a way they did. Because by creating monopoly power and giving that you wanted to buy something, anything. But we elected them. We what? elected them. We elected <coughs> Amazon. No, Amazon yeah. was just a little thing in a garage once. Yes. We but created it. We allowed there to be rules of the game that allowed Amazon to become a monopolist. And we had legal frameworks that we didn't enforce and we didn't have adequate legal frameworks. If we, my view is if we had an adequate legal framework, we would have stopped this kind of monopoly power, and then Amazon would not have been able to have the kind of, 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 of profits, and the same thing true with Walmart. Now, in the case of Walmart, they also engaged in corruption, they also engaged in gender discrimination, they also engaged in, uh, you know, uh, no labor unions, so they had a whole set of, of, of policy frameworks. So this is where our framework of re rewriting the rules comes in and say, if we have the right rules, we could make sure that that doesn't change the issue. We must try not to have a, a, a sort of um, dialogue. Shut tempting up. Okay. To, uh, <laughs> but, but let me just make one more point. I also very strongly agree that 
we've dichotomized the way our society functions between profit-making firms on the one hand and, and government. And in fact, there are many other institutional arrangements. Uh, most, my publisher, uh, publisher is, is Norton. They are also uh, a owner, a, 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 is a co-op. You know, you know. So there are many other examples, and I think we've circumscribed institutional innovation uh, too much, and we ought to open up that door. Uh, but we, again, those are part of the rules of the game that give an advantage to certain forms of, of enterprise over others. And maybe well, maybe you were flying over and missed another shake to the monopolistic system. Miss Amazon's just bought one of our big supermarkets, causing the price of all the other supermarkets to shut it down with yesterday. <laughs> so it's kind of moving. Ray, you just want to come in on this. Um, so I think just just uh, two points. I think there are the ways that we set up the sort of rules of the game that do influence who becomes kind of dominant. And I think there is an issue in the tax system in the UK and in some other that makes it harder for some of the our high street shops to compete with some of the online uh, retailers. In some sense, our tax system just hasn't kept up with the fact that there's this huge te technological change. I think on a more optimistic note, and I think for what we think about the kind of power of the consumer as well, is I think some of the technological change uh, is allowing some of the models of uh, collaborative consumption um, and the, the sort of sharing economy to become yeah. more established. Yeah. We're now more able to use our own goods and services to rent out a room uh, to share our car uh, in a way that we didn't used to be able to. And so on that level, I'm an optimist that some of that technology will help us to share more broadly uh, in some of that work. I share that too. The success of BNB is a good example of that. There are two questions side by side. I'm hoping that it might bear some similarity so we can take two at once. So Helen and your next door neighbour, who's mm -hmm. first actually in front. One of you go first. Yeah. Uh, my name is Helen Goodman. I'm a Labour MP in the north of England. I thought the most interesting explanatory part of what Professor Stiglitz said was his distinction between wealth and capital. And that really rang bells with me because London house prices are reaching astronomical levels, but so much other capital is concentrated in London, educational, cultural, good quality jobs, all these things are being dragged into our capital city. Um, and our QE has also been problematic because the top 5% are all nearly £200,000 <coughs> better off directly as a result of our, just of our QE. Um, so I just wonder what thoughts Professor Stiglitz has about how we can uh, shift the focus from wealth and the promotion of wealth and towards the promotion of capital. And let's take your neighbour's question as well. Well, it's related. David Pearshow from London School of Economics. Uh, um, given that uh, British politics have strange similarities with American politics at the moment, <laughs> I just wondered what Professor Stiglitz's ideas, what reaction, uh, what the attitude of uh, um, Clinton, Sanders, Trump and Rubio were to shape rewriting the uh, rules of the US economy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's definitely coming to you. I don't know if comment on the first question. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I, there actually uh, are, are a number of uh, policies. Some of them, uh, like so much else, uh, tax policy really does shape. So if we have uh, capital gains taxes, uh, uh, more uh, land taxes, a long tradition in progressive thought that uh, land taxes are actually the most efficient form of taxes mm -hmm. because the uh, elasticity supply of land is zero. And curiously, we tax land speculation at a lower rate than we do working. It's not anybody has ne never shown that by taxing land speculation at a lower rate we get more land. <laughs> so so it, this is a really, you might say, very foolish. And, and so if we encourage productive investment, uh, and I would go uh, further to say uh, we should actually have a financial system that makes that a priority. So for instance, you, you could say you can use the Fed discount window, you could, you could get, get money from the uh, Bank of England if you use that money for productive uses, but not if you're using it for land speculation. So I think there are many ways that we can encourage that kind of, of real investment that would increase the productivity of our societies. Um, 
On the other question, um, the rewriting the rules agenda is very much part of uh, Clinton's campaign. Uh, very, very, you know, very, very explicitly. And, and you will see, she gave a speech about short-termism, that was very much based on uh, on these ideas. So they, they are uh, uh, actually playing a, a very influential role in, in this presidential campaign. Sanders. Uh, also reflects very much uh, this kind of an agenda. It, it, he, he's been talking much more high level and hasn't gotten down to the programmatic. Uh, Hillary has been really good at actually laying out a programmatic agenda, which you'll see is very much uh, drawn from from rewriting the rules. Um, I uh, uh, the the other side, uh, the Republicans. I think uh, uh, agenda is to increase inequality, as far as I can see. <laughs> so uh, they're, they're it, it, you know, what, what is actually true, if you look about the different uh, Republican candidates, uh, if you were concerned about inequality, uh, uh, Trump is the one who is appealing most to those at the bottom and is the least likely, I mean, he's a demagogue, but the least likely to cut back on Social Security because he is sensitive <coughs> to what is going, he's not ideological, he has no principles. So, so that gives him a sensitivity uh, to, to his voters. Um, somebody like Cruz is an ideologue yeah. and uh, he is more likely to go on the war path and say Social Security, health care for, you know, guaranteeing health care, <coughs> access to health care, all of these things are undermining our society and he would get rid of them, and uh, if you want a, a real experiment, you know, this is going well beyond the Reagan experiment, a real experiment of what happens when you take away totally the social protection. If we get Cruz elected, we'll see that, ex uh, it actually would never get through Congress, but if it actually got through Congress, you would see an experiment uh, that would be, uh, for economists, wonderful to get a lot of data about uh, uh, how poverty can increase in relatively short span of time and equality increase. Uh, but uh, I think it would not be good for, for our society. Well, that's very helpful. We generally watch with alarm, I have to say. Torsten would like to just chip in on this two point. On the politics thing, I think we should just say it's quite a rainy day, so thank you for making us feel better that it's even worse uh, yeah. in politics somewhere else. And then on, on housing, which is an issue in most doing, economies that are doing well in developed world, housing is a growing issue, but it's a particular issue in the UK because we're not that big, especially if Scotland leads. Um, and so and on incomes, is a in the way that squeezed earnings has been a big issue for the last five years. Rising housing costs for the next may squeeze more so. For example, London has seen quite fast absolute income levels, but as soon as you take into account, in fact, that's obviously the highest, as soon as you take into account housing costs over the last year and a half, it's actually seen the worst performance in incomes. Yeah. So in terms of what people have got to spend, housing is dominating almost everything else in some chunks of the country. Can I just add one very brief point, which is, we're coming, uh, the Rosebud Institute is coming forward uh, shortly with a a new housing proposal, which uh, people don't realize that housing finance in the United States, the U.S. government, even though we believe that we're a private sector economy, the U.S. government is underwriting uh, more than 95% of all mortgages. And we uh, are coming up with a proposal that would take advantage of 21st century technology economies of scale and scope and uh, provide a rules-based way for the government to directly provide the mortgages, basically a right to access to mortgages at 80 percent of collateral, you know, 80 percent of the value of the, of, of the collateral at, say, 1 percent over the T-bill rate, using the income tax system as a framework for uh, collecting uh, payments. And we, we believe it would be a, a, a very efficient way of, of organizing uh, access to housing and bringing housing costs, and at the same time redirecting our financial system towards lending to small, medium sized enterprises to doing what it's supposed to do. So it would be both productive for our real sector, going at, at the other question that was asked, 
and lowering uh, uh, in increasing access to housing. It's an interesting model. We've got two more questions. We are very short of time, so if you can keep them short. There's one here, and then there's a gentleman on the back right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, David is from the Joseph Browntree Foundation. Um, there was an issue just touched on on the other side about geography, um, and I wanted to stick on that because we released the report earlier this week actually about relative decline of cities in the UK, which showed that there's a big, uh, there's an important uh, geography of inequality in the UK, um, and that cities in the north in particular are faring worse than uh, towns and cities in the south east in particular. Um, just wondered. Does the geography of inequality matter, first of all? And then secondly, when we think about economic geography, does that kind of imply a different set of policies? Is it enough? Do we still want to just focus on the rules of the game, or is there a need for some kind of active policies to look at where economic activity takes place and try and alter that? Oh, fellow economic geographer, to my own heart, <laughs> think about that one. That was a thunderstorm, by the way. <laughs> we have yes, and one more question on the back. Thanks very much, Tom Kerr from The Guardian. Um, I was just interested um, uh, to ask Professor Stiglitz about um, why the politics is flaring up now. So many of the trends you talk about uh, go back a long way. Male median wages stuck since 1973 or whatever it is. And uh, the bust with the link with productivity going back to about 1980. Um, so this could have happened in lots of elections. Why this one? Just, that's a very interesting question, uh, and that might others may have a view on that too. Your thoughts? I mean, in either order, if you like, the, the geography okay. of this or the why is yeah. it flaring up now? Yeah, I think the, the geography of inequality and poverty is very important. Uh, it is affected uh, by uh, when I say rules, we, we're we're talking about in a very broad broad stroke. So, for instance, uh, one of the points was that was raised was. Uh, getting access to jobs very important. If you build a urban, pub if you don't have an urban public transportation system, or you have one that doesn't connect poor people to jobs, they can't get jobs, or you know they can't get regular access to jobs. So, so that's an example of how you structure the 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 economy that really makes a very big difference. Uh, Scotland, uh, uh, you know, one of the very poor parts of Scotland were the Highlands. Fifty years ago, they began a explicit public program to try to develop the Highlands, and it's worked. Uh, Gary Gillespie can can tell you about uh, the successes of uh, of that. So that's an example where identifying geography is important. There's been a little bit of a, 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 a ideological point. Uh, we shouldn't care about geography, let's move people to jobs rather than jobs uh, to people. I think that's wrong. Geography is important and, and I think, uh, you know, one needs to do a little bit of both. On the, on the other question, in a way, I agree with you. I mean, I, I do agree with you. I've been surprised that this hasn't bubbled up earlier because all of those trends uh, were there, but uh, there are two two answers to why maybe now, finally. Uh, uh, one is, uh, it's gone on long enough, people can say it's not just one year or two years, it's a third of a century. And after a third of a century, people began to say, well, maybe the American dream isn't quite what we thought it was. You know, it's not just a bad year, it's a bad century. <laughs> and, and that's a different way of framing things than a bad year. You know, business cycles and all that. This is really a third of a century. So I think that's part of it. The second one is, um, what brings outrage as much as anything else is partly the inequality, but it's also a, system, a sense of fairness and injustice. And uh, Americans have seen just oodles, uh, lots of injustices. People were thrown out of their homes that didn't owe any money. None of the, none of the bankers were held accountable. The, uh, you know, the big short has brought that home. At the end of the big short, they say, they had that big thing, you know, they have to say, oh yes, and all these people went to prison. Yeah, not. <laughs> and, and the sense of the bankers walking away with million multi-million dollar bonuses and and they're left with in the picks, I think that really has motivated the anger 
across the spectrum, how that gets articulated, whether it's say in the, the, the inchoate anger on the, on the right or the more directed anger of trying to say, you know, what can we do about it more on the progressive side, across the spectrum there is a lot of anger. Ray, you want to chip in on this too? Uh, we're just uh, coming back to the um, the regional aspects. I think um, I think it does matter, and I think the the important point, particularly in the UK, is it isn't it isn't just about North uh, versus South. I'm sure some of your work also highlighted this that you know it's Manchester has done much better than Hull has, and within London there's also big issues. So I think a lot of the solution is. Uh, as Jason was saying, was around uh, transport infrastructure. If you don't have good public transport, uh, that has a much bigger impact on those on lower income um, ability to participate in the job market uh, than it does on uh, people with more income. Um, and I think more fundamentally in, in the UK, it is around uh, building the right high quality homes, um, uh, both for rent uh, and to buy. You know, we know we should be building 240,000 homes uh, every year. We haven't come close to that uh, over the past uh, 10 years. So that sort of gap in the future is, is going to get what get worse. And I think there is a bit of a misperception that that, that is all about London and the South East. It's not. It's about the quality of homes uh, throughout the UK. And there are issues uh, as much on that in the North as there is in the South. Well, thank you very much, Ray. We, we have actually run out of time. One or two people are beginning to go. So I think, you know, to be fair to the panel and um, the rest of the audience, we probably should conclude questions there. Maybe you, and some of you will be able to just stay around after the discussion. Liam and I have to get into the House of Commons to <laughs> secure a seat for Prime Minister's questions. But just to say, I think, you know, it's been a really interesting morning and we are really very fortunate to have you come and share this with us. There were many times I wanted to leap up and ask you a question. There are lots of things I could say about this. But, you know, there was, there was kind of one thing I just would, would share that really struck me, that it saddens me greatly there is less social mobility in my country than there was when I was a child. Something's gone seriously wrong. Something very few of you would even know is that Liam and I actually went to the same school. And I don't know about you, Liam, but nobody in my family had ever gone to university before we went to our school. And it just shows you what a pivotal role education plays in society. And when that starts to go backwards, then you're in a big, long uh, period of work to try and turn that round. And other things like infrastructure are absolutely key. And speaking as a West Midlands MP, just watching the renaissance of manufacturing, which everybody thought was dying in our country, and seeing how that's giving single mums the opportunity of a decent wage on the production line on their night shifts, which works with their family responsibilities. It's just, you know, remarkable. So there are interesting currents going on in this country, but some of the fundamentals, like education, really deeply concern me, and that's why I'm involved with this group. But thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Really good questions, thoughtful questions, and really, you know, it, it's been like a smorgasbord turn the course <laughs> of information this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Sure. Uh, if, if anyone wants to see the video for later, if you check out our Facebook page, APPG Inclusive Growth, the video's on there later, and some of the paperwork from uh, today.